Uh, dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses can be extremely challenging. They spend hours a week studying to talk to us. We rarely spend hours a week studying to talk to them. Uh, they have a mistranslation of the Bible that can uh, greatly uh, impact our ability to address certain texts of Scripture without a knowledge of the original languages and things like that. But one of the mechanisms that I have found that, that has been very helpful in getting Jehovah's Witnesses to think is to present to them the truth about Jesus Christ found in Scripture not the texts that identify Jesus as God. There are texts that do that. They are prepared to argue all of those texts. But to demonstrate that Jesus is identified as Jehovah. Now, the proper pronunciation is Yahweh, but uh, there's no reason to argue with a Jehovah's Witness over that particular issue at, at, at the door. And one of the ways that I do that is I ask them to turn in their scriptures to Psalm 102, 25 through 27, read it in their, own, in their own Bible. And there it talks about God as the one who at the beginning laid the foundation of the world and, and who alone stretch out heavens. And, and it's, it's talking about how God is impassable. He does not change. He does not age. He does not grow weak or anything like this. And I ask them, is there anyone other than Jehovah that this could be descriptive of? Because only Jehovah is eternal, only Jehovah does not change, et cetera, et cetera. Then I say, well, keep your finger there, and could you read for me uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12? Well, you go to Hebrews chapter 1, and speaking of the Son of God, back in verse 8, verse 10 is a quotation of Psalm 102, 25 through 27. It's the exact same text, but here it's being applied to Jesus in Hebrews chapter one. Now, when a Jehovah's Witness sees this, you need to keep something in mind. If all you wanna do is win an argument, if all you wanna do is get out your theological sword and run somebody through, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, aha, Mr. Jehovah's Witness, how do you answer that one? And they'll come up with an answer that will probably be the dumbest thing they've ever said, but they'll go to their grave believing it because you've forced them to. What you want to do is when you show someone anything they've never seen before, but especially in this particular context, you want to, in that moment, that awkward moment after they see what's actually being said, you immediately say, now, if you've not seen that before, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to ask you for a response to that. Um, I, I'd like to talk to you about that some more sometime. Maybe we can get together again sometime to talk about it. But could I show you another? Now, what you've done is you've taken the pressure off of them. They can now look at it and think about it without having to defend something they've already said. You may have opened, opened up the opportunity for a further conversation with them. And you've given yourself the opportunity to present a second example where Jesus is identified as Jehovah. And one of the places I do that is I take them to John chapter 12 where after Jesus, this is the end of his public ministry, the Greeks have come seeking him. He doesn't show himself to the Greeks. And there's that interesting text quoted from Isaiah chapter six uh, about hardening people's hearts. And then John makes this, this uh, in judgment, he hardens their hearts. And, and there, John makes this strange statement. He said, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and he spoke about him, Isaiah, John 12, 41. And where did Isaiah see Jesus's glory? Well, you look back at what he had just quoted from Isaiah 6, in Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah's temple vision, I saw the Lord lofty and lifted up, sitting upon his temple, throne of his robe, the, the train of his robe was filling, was filling the temple. What's interesting is in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, there's a slight difference from the Hebrew. It actually says his glory was filling the temple. And so what John is doing is he is quoting from Isaiah 6, and he's saying, Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. If you ask Isaiah, Isaiah, whose glory did you see? I saw Jehovah. If you ask Jesus, whose glory did Isaiah see? I'm sorry, if you ask John, whose glory did Isaiah see? John's answer is he saw the glory of Jesus. And so you have two passages where if they, the, as, as deeply as they want to dig into the text, all it's going to do is show them with more and more clarity the fact that the writers of the New Testament, two different writers of the New Testament, identified Jesus as Jehovah. And for a Jehovah's Witness, you can argue all day long whether he's called God, a God, big God, little God, doesn't matter. If Jesus is identified as Jehovah, game over. That's it. The society's authority is done. 
And the nice thing is, you're not handing them a tract or a book. Most of them won't take that anyways. You're showing it to them in their own New World Translation. And I've never had a Jehovah's Witness leave their Bible behind when they left. <laughs>